is your photography going stale? This is the Wild Eye Podcast. Hey everybody, my name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye. I'm back from a really, really cool break, uh, personal, I took leave, to a small town called Hogs Back in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. And I spent quite a bit of time doing landscape photography. Now, I chose to do this because, number one, it takes me out of my comfort zone. Number two, I'm preparing for Iceland and I had to kind of give some new equipment a test drive, some filters and graduated filters and stuff like that. And I actually recorded a video in which I linked to my newsletter where I share some thoughts on photography as self-care. Now, that's a topic for a different day, but what I wanted to touch base on here is, hmm, is your photography going stale? How do I do this? I didn't have signal while I was away, which was amazing. But when I then got back and I did some catching up on social media, I got this feeling that nothing is changing. And I don't mean that from an algorithm point of view or a content point of view. I would see images from people, photographers, and I would then link through to see, because of the algorithm works, I would link through to their page to go and see what I've missed, just maybe some inspiration or whatever. And to be dead, brutally honest, I didn't miss anything. So the definition of stale is having lost freshness, effervescence, or palatability. Are you willing to be honest enough with yourself and question your own photography in that manner? So I look at a lot of young photographers coming up, and I understand why they only want to post big cats, lions, leopards, all over the place. But because why? Because it normally gets pretty decent views on Instagram, right? But after a while, it gets boring. You're not challenging yourself anymore. You're not exploring your creativity anymore. You're not producing fresh content anymore. And I believe that if you keep doing that, you are killing your photographic voice. You're killing your creative voice and passion. It's a difficult thing, though, because how do you know? How do you know your photography is going down a route where you go into a holding pattern? I said in the past, in some of the blogs I've written, and I think maybe on the podcast as well, that being, because a lot of people would argue and say, yeah, 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 but that's my style. My style is to photograph lions and leopards in a certain way, and that's what I share out. I process it with a slight sepia tint, and that's my style. The argument, though, falls flat in my eyes because having a style and being in a rut is very, very close together. Very close together. Many years ago, and I've told the story as well, is I had a trip, uh, a guest on one of my trips, and she was super keen to learn about high-key photography. How does it work? She was brand new into the game, so how does high-key photography work? So we did the whole thing, overexposed by 2.7 to 3, then in, 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 in post, bring back your blacks, and you get this very high, washed-out image with solid blacks in it as well. For certain images, it's golden. It really works well. But she then proceeded to apply that, that technique and that vision for her images to literally every single image that she created. Some images doesn't lend itself to high-key work. Now, whether that's a, a, a creative thing in that the content isn't high-key uh, compatible, so to speak, it just doesn't make sense, or whether the tonal values in the image is doable into that kind of style, everything was forced into it. So if you're a hammer, everything, if you're a nail, if you're a hammer, I can get this right, everything looks like a nail. And she then approached her entire photography because she wanted that style of photography. Problem is, it made her end up in a rut. So coming back from my trip away, I had a look through some Instagram stuff and unfortunately, there's a lot of the younger photographers that it starts looking boring. Guys, you need to, and this is not just for the young photographers, it's for everybody. If you are doing photography, you need to keep it fresh. And I'm not even talking about it, doing it for the audience. I'm talking about doing it for yourself. I've discovered or rediscovered something in the last few weeks. I decided to step out of my comfort zone, 
which is wildlife and kind of nature, and specifically focus on things like macro photography and landscape photography. I mentioned this in the video that I spoke about earlier on, but for me, going out and being in this incredibly beautiful place like Hogsback with these waterfalls, and they're truly, they're truly spectacular. I didn't know these things existed, but it is truly spectacular. To slow down where instead of shooting one over thousandth of an image, well, one, one over thousandth of a shutter speed at 24 frames a second because you want to get the leopard yawning, to shooting an image that takes 60 seconds to expose. The change was dramatic. It made me think more because, number one, my OCD side would say, okay, listen, this is going to take 60 seconds to shoot, so make sure you get it right because you can't just redo it quickly. It's going to take some time. But it also made me stop and appreciate the moment. It made me appreciate the moment of standing there up to my ankles in water, my tripod half buried in the river, photographing the, the, the waterfalls at slow shutters. I would do something, for example, where I would photograph um, a high-resolution image. Now, what the Olympus sensor does is it basically, because you're, you're, you're on tripod, the sensor actually moves, and it shoots eight different versions, if you will, and it slightly moves on each one, combines it into a very high-res file. And if I'm shooting, for example, a 30-second exposure, and now I have eight of those it has to do to combine it, I'm looking at a four minutes exposure where I'm standing waiting. Now, that is something you don't always get with nature or wildlife photography, because you are so chasing the single moment, and you're shooting off all these frames that you don't often stop and recognize the moment and how amazing it is. That, I think, is missing for a lot of people. I think if you are just posting one thing, I think you are missing out. I think you are missing out on experiences. I think you are missing out on images. I think you are missing out on uh, skill transfers. So someone asked me yesterday when I'm back, so what is the skill transfer I'm talking about? So from a landscape photography point of view, composition is a hell of a lot more important because of the long shots. Wildlife photography is very, very heavy, very heavy on the subject. We don't always pay that much attention to the background or the, or the, the secondary compositional elements of the frame. If the subject is sharp and in focus and it's cool, we can let the other part go. Where landscape photography teaches you composition. It teaches you to look at leading lines more. It teaches you to look at the flow of your eyes through the frame. All these things that we teach at base level, but when you get to wildlife photography, we tend to forget these things because we are so intent on getting that singular moment. So landscape photography does that. It slows you down. It makes you think about composition. It makes you think more about depth of field. It makes you think more about your shutter speed. It makes you understand exposure more because you have time to, to focus on these variables, right? And you don't have to worry about the subject running away. You're waiting for the light to pop. You're waiting for the shadow to move just over that rock so that that exposes better. It also helps you, and I can, I'm speaking for myself here, it also helps you to look at a scene and find images within a scene. So I was, for example, I was shooting at the Madonna and Child Waterfall in Hog's Back, and I was shooting on a 16 mil. I had filters and stuff in the front. But then once it's done, I put on an 80 to 300 2.8. I put the filters in front of that, and then I'm creating images. So now I'm looking at this big scene, and I'm seeing things in the frame. For those of you that have traveled with me, I've often spoken about it in terms of deconstructing your subject. So the rage at one stage was you go to a restaurant and they would, they would serve you a deconstructed lemon meringue, which is basically giving you the ingredients on a plate, right? Which, yeah, each to his own. But what I meant in the field with deconstructing your subject is if a subject is so close that you can't use your telephoto anymore and you get to the point where you almost can't use your wide angle anymore, then deconstruct the subject. And think about it this way. If you had a picture of that subject on your wall, and you had to surround it with eight other pictures, what would you do? Photograph the eyes, the tail, the texture of the skin, and so on. So deconstructing the subject is something I've done for a long time, and something I've taught a lot of my clients on safari. But with wildlife photography, it's more intentional. It's looking at the moments and the compositions inside the composition. And I believe that skill transfer is huge. Macro? 
same thing. So macro photography, what that would teach you is again, you're looking for you're looking for scenes within a scene because you normally you don't look at something. You have to focus on the thing that you're going to photograph, which you normally don't even see. But the big thing that you can learn from there is depth of field. Because if you're shooting, uh, I'm shooting a 60 mil 2.8 macro on the four third system, which is an equivalent 120 because it doubles it up. And the, the, the literal depth of field that you're shooting is probably like half a millimeter in instances, probably smaller. Because the subject, um, I was photographing a praying mantis recently, and the subject, he would move a little bit in the wind and the whole thing's off. So it teaches you and it refines your understanding of depth of field and how apertures work. I, it's, it, you cannot deny that there's a skill transfer. So I'm a little bit, not confused, I'm, what's the word I'm looking for here? I, I would like to see more wildlife photographers broaden their horizons and start shooting nature. Because inside of nature, you can do landscape, you can do macro, you can even do travel because you're traveling to and from places. But not just focus on one thing. I understand you like leopards. I understand you like lions. But at some stage, your photographic passion, your photographic eye, your photographic vision is going to go into autopilot. And there's certain parts of photography that should be on an autopilot, but when it comes to creating and thinking about the things you want to photograph and show people, maybe not a good thing. Because then your style becomes a rut. You want to diversify. You want to try different things. I remember this in probably one of the very first wildlife Q&A videos I ever did. I mentioned that the, the, the normal growth or the, the, the root, if you will, of wildlife photographers is often this. They buy a camera and with it they get an 18 to 55 short lens and a 70 to 300. And that becomes their main weapon. They then realize, okay, shit, 70 to 300 is cool because I can get closer. They then get a 100 to 400 or an 80 to 400 in the old days for Nikon. And they shoot everything at 400. Then they realize, hey, I can get a 600 or an 800 on a rental and I can get even closer still. The problem, and that's fine. That's fine. There's a time and a place for that. The problem is if you don't start pulling back from that extreme ranges, your stuff's all going to look the same. And I look at some people's, and look, granted, an, an Instagram feed isn't a portfolio. A lot of you think it is, and you just post as if it is. It's not. It's a random collection of images shared at random times. But all of it looks the same because you are using the same lens. You are always tight in. You are always photographing just on the main species, whether it's lion, leopards, rhino, whatever the case is. Some people, literally, there are a lot of people out there who only put big cats on their feet. Now, I get it. You dig it. You like the big cats. You think they photograph well. And yes, they do. But from someone watching your work, after a while, it gets stale. It gets boring. And I think, and this is where the brutal honesty with yourself comes in, is you have to think for yourself, what else can I do to grow as a photographer? It's the same as gym, right? If you go to the gym, you can do 10 bicep curls every single day. After a couple of weeks, there's no more benefit because your body's adjusted, right? You can then, for example, to change something, you can do something small before. You can do 20 push-ups and then do your bicep curls. Your body will adjust again because now the stimulus is different. Photographically, we can do the same thing. Use a different lens, but use the same approach. Use a different aperture, but use the same approach. Process your images differently, but photograph the same thing. Something needs to change. And I'm speaking from a personal point of view here. I... After, after doing this a long time, after photographing wildlife for a long time, I started to, my photographic voice, my, my creative eye started getting tired. It started losing interest because it's the same thing again and again. So especially to you young wildlife photographers, look at diversifying how you shoot. You might not like the images you get when you pack your bags 
If you're in Johannesburg, you go to the Walter Susulu Botanical Gardens, you photograph the waterfall over there, you might not think it's amazing, right? Because your, your, your North Star for what is amazing photographically is based on what you've always done. You might not get the same amount of people liking or engaging with your image online because they're used to you posting lines, but there's the problem. Then you're doing it for them, not for yourself. Stale. Having lost freshness, effervescence, or palatability. Lacking originality or spontaneity. A stale joke, for example. Ineffective or uninspired, usually from being out of practice or having done the same thing for too long. Those are all definitions of stale. I think in the old days, before Instagram and being able to share these things like we do, it might have been more difficult to isolate it when you got to that point because we were all living in these individual eco chambers. It was just us doing my thing. I might show a print here or do a book where my family can buy it. But now with things going out all the time, it's very easy to fall in a trap where what you think is your style becomes a rut very easy to fall into that trap and here's the truth it is not going to change on its own you have to make it change you have to make a choice try a different lens try a different genre the crossover between genres is going to make you a better photographer it will you're not going to get worse at wildlife photography if you start shooting some landscapes you are not suddenly going to lose your, your, your skills as a wildlife photographer if you suddenly focus on some macro things. Guys, my next trip, so my next trip, I'm going to Svalbard. And in the past, it's, also, it's always been kind of um, still based on the wildlife, but a little bit more landscapes. I'm going to double down on the landscapes when I get there. Yes, the wildlife's there. If it's there, I will shoot it. But I'm going to maximize the time and do other things as well. When you, for example, in Svalbard, start looking at shooting landscapes, you can shoot the landscapes because of the beauty of the landscape. You can compose according to the lines, the textures, the shapes, the flow of energy through the frame. And while you do this, your wildlife photographic brain as such will tell you, oh shit, wouldn't this be cool if there was a polar bear here or a whole lot of walruses there? When you then go back to wildlife and you see the things, your your, your your creative voice will speak louder and you will create better images. I believe this 1 million percent. After that, I'm off to Iceland where the focus is 100 percent. Okay, cancel. Where the focus is 95 uh, percent landscapes. The other 5 percent would be kind of Icelandic horses and puffins if you're lucky enough. But that would be the focus. And it's... <sighs> The skill transfer, the, the, the changing of your mind to slow down and shoot landscapes. I'm, I'm not sure why more wildlife photographers don't want to do it. Is it because, and maybe you must ask yourself these questions, maybe you're not, maybe you're not willing to be bad at something again. Maybe you're not willing for people to look at your work and say, mm, not so sure about this one. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Definition of stale. No longer fresh. No longer appealing. Having lost freshness, effervescence, or palatability. Lacking originality and spontaneity. Guys, for, especially for my young wildlife photographers out there, look at your feeds. Look at it honestly. Ask someone for feedback. What you think is a style might be a rut and you are leaving photographic growth, photographic inspiration, photographic quality, photographic skills, and a beautiful photographic portfolio on the table if you are not going to start questioning whether your photography is stale or not. It's a very hard thing to break out of, but awareness thereof, I think, is the first thing. It's a big deal. It really is. Anyway. I'm going to go and uh, get back to work here. And if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. If you would like to send me your Instagram feed on Instagram or as an email, and you would like some honest feedback, hit me up. Send me a direct message and say, I listened to podcast episode 391, and I would love some honest feedback. 
but then be ready for honest feedback because nobody wants to be told how ugly their baby is. Get it? Exactly. So with that, go and try different things. Shoot different things. Try different things. Just anything, but change. Don't become stale in your photography or in your approach to your own photography. I promise you, there is only upside. There really is only upside. With that said, guys, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening. And um, you know where to get hold of me, jerry at wildeye.co.za and jerry Fennevolt on all the social media platforms. I would love to hear from you. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for your ears. And if you're on YouTube, thank you for watching. I will see you in the next episode. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. Have a good one. <laughs>